the fact that you have to pay six dollars plus a gallon for gas in LA right now and much of the country's four dollars plus right now that's way bigger than any auto strike in Detroit okay that's almost completely irrelevant the fact that everybody's getting absolutely bent over when it comes to freaking gas prices right now two years in a row and people aren't going to forget this folks um Believe me, that's the best thing ever for Tesla because every single person is thinking, dang, man, an EV for my next vehicle sounds a lot better. It would be so much cheaper to just charge at home than have to go to this gas station and pay four, five, six dollars a gallon. How do there, folks? Welcome into today's video. Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood on Bloomberg just a few hours ago speaking about stocks, her strategy, Tesla, many other subjects. Want to get straight into this? I appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thank you so much for being subscribed, folks. We are now at a new all-time high subscriber, so I appreciate each and every one of you for always being here. With all you've been through the last number of years, are you going to shift to a more long-term strategy? I look at Morningstar, one year, three year, five year, your bottom quartile, but your claim is more short term. With your new ETF effort and with what you're doing with ARC, are you going to be still on trend or do you invest more for long term? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was not expecting the, the interview to start like that. This man's just basically saying you're a short term trader. And are you going to focus more long term? And Kathy Wood, this is shocking. What a way to start this interview. I'm interested to hear how she handles this because she's supposed to be, uh, you know, long term, looking out long term. Oh, my gosh. What? We've always invested for the long term. And uh, what interrupted what was a very nice move up in innovation stocks, especially disruptive innovation, was a massive increase in interest rates, the likes of which we have never sure, seen. 24-fold increase. So all long-duration assets, especially in 2022, were destroyed, including bonds, which are usually a flight to safety. They had their worst year last year uh, right. since the 1700s. There's no <laughs> way in that environment that our strategy would have done well. But I do think that what's happening this year is that the market is starting to look over the Fed's moves, whether there's one more or not, uh, into uh, falling interest rates. You know, we started underperforming in 21 just with the anticipation of rising rates, and even more so in 22. So how are you going to change? I want to know how you're going to change the sobering quarters you've been through. What is the new Kathy Wood approach to macroeconomics frankly, pandemic economics intruding on your belief in innovation. Uh, if anything, innovation gains traction during tough times. And if you look at how the reason... Yeah, I'm telling you, man, they, <laughs> those are two brutal questions. First off, he's asking, like, are you even long-term, okay? And, and basically saying she's a short-term trader. Then he goes, stops in basically in this next question, oh my gosh, then he's going ahead and saying, like, you know, what have you learned? Like, you know, how are you going to approach the market moving forward? What strategy are you going to adapt now? Because you haven't been doing well. Whoa, okay. Our, our portfolios are outperforming this year. Is, and they are. And they are. Is It is because they are gaining share in what is becoming a difficult environment. Right. right? And so, uh, one by one, we're going to earn our way back. Right. And it's all about revenue growth, margin expansion. Okay. That's not that... I mean... Considering how maybe on the riskier side she invests, that's not that great. They, she might be barely beating the cues this year. Um, the public counts killing her returns this year. I think we're we're over a double up of that. So, I mean, I don't know. Like for how bad last year was, you need to have even a much bigger bounce back year, in my opinion, than what she's having this year. Wall Street Journal they do a fabulous thing with old farts like me and his people. This is brutal, man. Those are two brutal brutal questions in a row. This guy definitely didn't come in to, to kiss Kathy Wood's butt in regards to this situation. Holy smokes. With over $5 million, and they believed in Kathy Wood. To a person, those retirees bought innovation, they bought tech, they bought Apple, 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 and they didn't listen to financial TV or radio. Can you do the Kathy Wood approach for one, three, five years, given the volatility you've seen? Yes, I think we're on the other side of that massive interest rate increase, mm -hmm. which did destroy a lot of performance. That's the most important thing. And 
We are ready for prime time. Many people are concerned about our kind of strategy, and uh, and uh, the company we just acquired rises mm -hmm. in uh, because in Europe, in London here, uh, for all of Europe and UK, uh, uh, they're focused on global mega trends as well. And you know, interest rates hurt everyone in that space. If we are right, uh, and rates are going to come down at some point in the next year, you know, the the market is a discounting mechanism, uh, then uh, I think that uh, the muscle memory that, that hurt our strategy, and it all has everything to do with the tech and telecom bust, and people thinking, oh my gosh, are we here again? No. What happened during the 20 years that ended in the tech and telecom bubble is the seeds for, uh, for what is happening now were planted. Yeah. And, and this, John, is really important and that the profitability stream down the income statement of new tech is very different and 2000 tech. Do you want to know what truly is the best thing going for Tesla right now? Like literally today, okay? I'll tell you what it is. The fact that you have to pay $6 plus a gallon for gas in LA right now, and much of the country's $4 plus right now, that's way bigger than any auto strike in Detroit, okay? That's almost completely irrelevant. The fact that everybody's getting absolutely bent over when it comes to freaking gas prices right now two years in a row and people aren't going to forget this folks um believe me that's the best thing ever for tesla because every single person is thinking dang man an ev for my next vehicle sounds a lot better it would be so much cheaper to just charge at home than have to go to this gas station and pay four five six dollars a gallon and spend a hundred dollars two hundred dollars a week or whatever right so that's actually the best thing going on for Tesla that I don't think nearly enough people are talking about. I think that there's just now the, the supply chain has freed up, so unfortunately we'll have all kinds of questions about that. But, you know, I don't, I don't think it has anything really to do with the strike. It has uh, everything to do with the consumer preference shift towards better vehicles, electric, uh, that are falling in price. Tesla's leading that, uh, that price decline simply by passing cost declines on to its uh, customers. Uh, so I think that's what's good for Tesla. The complaint we hear is that people can't afford these vehicles. Uh, that what is, we're that the is changing. In the UK, as you can see, Rishi Sunak is pushing back targets to get rid of all of these internal combustion engines to 2035 from 2030. Are yes. we being unrealistic about this transition? And uh, we don't this think is so. Be? No, no, no. We do not think so. We actually, the total cost of ownership, now this is in the United States, it's a little bit different here, <clears throat> But the total cost of ownership of an electric vehicle uh, fell below that of a gas-powered vehicle about two to three years ago. Soon, sticker prices. Does that include insurance? Yes, includes insurance. Yes, in as I said, local differences. But yes, in the United States, that does include insurance. And in fact, Tesla is so sure that uh, its cars will have fewer accidents mm -hmm. and fewer fatalities that it's well willing to provide right. insurance. So yes, that damn man. All these years later, and these guys still haven't done enough research on Tesla. Lee, the fact that you even ask a question like about insurance, it just shows me like completely clueless in regards to stock and completely clueless around EVs and everything like that. Like if you're an insurance company, if anything, you'd much rather insure a $50,000 Tesla versus a $50,000 internal combustion engine vehicle any day of the week. The technology on Tesla is leaps and bounds better than an internal combustion engine when it comes to safety features. And it's not even close. Not even remotely close, okay? On a Tesla, you got cameras all over that vehicle alerting you to anything, right? You obviously have, uh, you know, autopilot and, and all the other programs Tesla has. I mean, it's like a night and day. It's, oh gosh, man, like that just shows me like they still haven't done research. It, it amazes me all these years later. Does include everything, all in. You were at USC. You didn't get a B. Uh, Laffer called up Robert Kirby at Capital Group and said, just shut up and hire her. So you walk <laughs> into Capital Group, which is the land of an R squared and 98 Washington Mutual Fund Investment Company yes. of America. Yes. Everything is completely diversified out. You're the polar extreme. They threw you out. The, you almost fell into the Pacific Ocean. They were so upset with you. So you go out and you say, I'm I'm not going tight R squared to SPX. I'm going out and do my own thing. Yes. People have prospered off of innovation and technology. How does that continue in America? Can you be less diversified and win five years out? 
Well, you mentioned Capital Group, and that is where I did start my career, and that is where. Uh, let me hold, hold, hold your horses. Hold your horses for just a moment, okay? Whoa, whoa, whoa. So this gentleman's making it sound like Kathy Wood's not diversified. That's almost the way he's making it, like concentrated bets. Let me be very clear. You look at Kathy Wood's ARK ETF and her other ETFs as well. They're actually very diversified. She can't even have a position be more than 10% of size. Like, you know, if she has to sell off Tesla all the time, cause sometimes it becomes too big of a weight in there. And you look at how many stocks she holds. It's a lot of stocks, man. So... Yeah, just because you don't hold 500 stocks like the S&P 500 does not mean, I'll tell you, Warren Buffett, way less diversified than Kathy Wood when it comes to the stock portfolio. Look at Berkshire Hathaway's stock portfolio. Over 50% of the capital is in one stock, Apple, okay? One stock. So, I, you know, th that was just a, a poor point in my personal opinion. She's actually extremely diversified. Doesn't mean those are necessarily good stocks she holds, but she is very diversified. Um, I saw tremendous research and a long-term time horizon. So really what we're doing with ARC is just going back to the future. My initial experience, which was in the late 70s when right. I was in college, and uh, we're doing deep research, first principles based, white sheet of paper. But you're away from an R squared like Washington Mutual or the other funds. What's your R squared right now? Uh, to be honest, we're, the correlation of our uh, performance to broad-based benchmarks is very low, uh, for better or worse. What it, tells, what it tells our clients and prospective clients is we, uh, we have a very good diversification strategy. Our, our funds, the active weight, if you're comparing to MSCI World or S&P or NASDAQ, the active weight is less than 5%. So really good diversification strategy focused on companies uh, that are going to transform the way the world works. Uh, we look at the broad-based benchmarks, and sure, there are companies that are sustaining innovation like an Apple, but they are not going to transform the way wor the world works from here. Our companies are. So we're in the middle phases of Tesla's growth story, says Dan Ives. Want to hear what Dan Ives has to say here from a day ago, uh, kind of react to this, give my opinions and perspectives where I view Tesla's growth as somebody that's been investing in the stock for many years. Now at this point in time, kind of share my perspectives there. Let's get into this. Bring in Dan Ives, Managing Director of Equity Research with Wedbush Securities. Great to see you. Hey, great to be here. I mean, there's always been a fear of unions at Tesla. I just see that as basically minimal probability that's going to ever happen. I think Tesla... It's a win-win situation because when you look at the big three, what's happening here, it's a debacle in Detroit because ultimately this is going to be passed to the consumer when eventually they do get a deal. And the EV strategy, I mean, this is a gut punch to borrow Farley, what they've built over the years. And I think that's really the frustration right now in this Rubik's Cube, where I believe the UAW deal, if they took that, it would essentially impair the business models for the, for us in the next decade. For the big three, that is. It will impair the business model because they'll be forced to pay so much more to the workforce that they will not be able to invest in the conversion to electric vehicles? Exactly. They're going up against non-union Tesla, non-union Rivian, foreign automakers. And that's why right now, Champagne on Ice has been for Tesla in terms of the pending competition that's coming out of Detroit. And that's why this UAW, it's a nightmare on Elm Street in terms of what's happened in Detroit. Why is it that Tesla... Yeah, so, and here's how Tesla could use this as a longer-term advantage to kind of, let's call it, not unionize the Tesla workforce, in my opinion, Okay. So what's going to happen here with the, these big automakers is, one, obviously, their cost is going to go up immensely. It's going to hurt their business. Their numbers are probably going to get much worse over the coming years. And they're also likely going to end up moving production over the coming years down to Mexico. So Tesla are going to be like, okay, you know, if workers want to unionize, you can. But just understand, that's what all these other automakers did. And now they're just going to end up shifting. They, they shifted their production to Mexico, right? They, they're, uh, you know, not putting up the sales volume because they had to raise price a lot. And so those same workers ended up getting fired, right? Laid off, hours cut, right? Plants closed, factories closed. So that's what's going to end up happening. So if anything, I think, you know, Tesla's going to be able to give this as an example longer term, you know, five years out, seven years out. 
on why there should not be a union, in my opinion. Demand has been so soft. Is it simply that they've overproduced and they can't cut prices enough to, because there's just no pent up demand uh, additionally for EVs? And there's another, another. But why is it that those delivery numbers and that they have so much excess inventory right now? How long is it going to take for that to be absorbed? And so we think it's really fourth quarter. I mean, if I look overall, take a step back. If you look at 1.8 million, where I believe is going to be deliveries for the year. That's a super strong number relative to the environment. I think margins, trough, and Phil's talked about that as well. Q4, I think you have Cybertruck that starts production, a refresh of Model 3. And I think in China, they actually start to gain more share. That's why, in our view, this is more of what I view as a pause into the next phase of the Tesla growth story, which is why we've been telling our investors here, you continue to own this name. How did they go from not being able, a year ago, not... Yeah, the one thing Tesla needs to... uh have work for them. That's just their biggest headwind Tesla has right now has nothing to do with any other automakers or anything. Biggest headwind Tesla has right now that's hurting them is interest rates. Uh, you know, it's just much more expensive to get a car loan today than it was 18 months ago and certainly 24 months ago. It's a whole different ball game, folks. And so that's just, it's hurting Tesla's margins considerably in the short term. It's not going to be like that forever. I can tell you that, but for right now, it's, uh, it's, hurting every automaker, but it's certainly hurting Tesla, right? To meet demand uh, to this, the situation where they are right now. Yeah, what I mean, happened? Look, demand definitely soft, and we've seen that in China in terms of century price war that's happened in China. But I believe the poker move of cutting prices, that was the right thing. I think we've seen it in the stock in terms of stimulating demand for Tesla. But no doubt, they are definitely going through a transition in terms of what we're seeing with demand in the U.S. globally. But if you look at scale and where they, we believe they could get to production, we're going to be looking at next year or two a company that's going to be 2.5 million, ultimately in the 3 million, where, what they're going to see from a delivery as well as a production. I think this is just, Tyler, in my opinion, this is just what I'll call the middle phases of the next phase of the Tesla growth story taking place. I- so something super important to remember in regards to Tesla's margins and their future profitability is very important is Cybertruck likely should be a massive help to margins and profitability starting at some point in 2024. Obviously, you have that awkward, let's call it, stage of ramping a vehicle and you have problems that arise. And so the first quarter or two of producing those vehicles aren't usually very profitable. And sometimes you can even lose money. But once you get up to scale, but remember, when it comes to pickup trucks, like that's usually the most profitable segment for automakers. Like it's the holy grail. And so don't be surprised if Cybertruck ends up being just an incredibly profitable vehicle and the most profitable vehicle we've ever seen um, and the best margin vehicle we've ever seen uh, from Tesla over time. So we'll see how it all plays out, obviously, but I wouldn't be surprised if Cybertruck's margins are incredible. Uh, let's just call it on a longer term basis. Wonder, though, about competing with BYD. I mean, I there they have more models. They have they update them more quickly. They have more colors. You know, it's already Chinese models are like some of the top selling vehicles in Europe already. They also have um, what's the smaller one? The the four letters. Uh, anyway, there's it's not just BYD, which is formidable, but it, yeah. there's other Chinese automakers as well. And you read about these. These are not like, you know, low cost, cheap businesses. BYD is like it's like the Japan of the 2020s in terms of the impact that Japanese automakers had on the market back then. So you do wonder if Tesla, even having an advantage to the big three, how does it not get undercut? And and if they keep the Chinese uh, cars out of this market, maybe it'll be fine. But how does it not get undercut? Look, This is an arms race. I mean, this is a game of throwing that's going on and you see what happened in China. I've seen it firsthand. BYD, NEO, Xping, and others. I mean, some of the best EVs out there. I think where Tesla has been so successful because of their ability to expand gig in terms of Shanghai, what they've been able to do from a price perspective, and the Chinese consumer, especially on the high end or rising middle class, they do want Teslas. But to your point, do Chinese EV vehicles come here into the U.S.? Ultimately, that actually becomes the issue. It seems the one missing plank for Tesla would be if they had a Model 2 or some kind of lower cost mass market car that could compete against the Chinese or just make it more affordable for a lot of Americans who might be tempted to switch. But that feels like it's just way off in the distance at this point. But I believe by the end of next year, a sub 30K vehicle is introduced by Musk, plus with Cybertruck. And that's why I just view this is in the early days, even with Supercharger and the sum of the parts. 
this is not an auto company. This is a disruptive technology company. That's why you know, we're buying here, despite what I'll call definitely nothing right home about, type of 3Q delivery number. All right. Dan, uh, thanks what? for now. Thanks we for appreciate me. it. Dan Lauren, Ives. I'm shocked. I am absolutely shocked. The U.S. automakers are already going to have uh, big problems to deal with. They already have big problems to deal with, right? If you want to eliminate the complete auto sector from the United States, then sure, you let them flood Chinese cars in here for 25K, 20K, 30K, whatever, and, and then just watch, you know, the, the automakers, a dealership model that produces a massive amount of jobs. Like, think about how many jobs between all the parts in the United States, the factories, think about, uh, obviously, all the dealership model and all the people that make money from that. You know, take that away. And then all of a sudden you got all these Chinese cars coming in here. Oh, what a disaster. What an absolute disaster. So, no, okay. Like I said, U.S. government makes some very questionable decisions. They're not that dumb, okay? Tom Lee. He says this is the time to get into Fang. We're going to hear what our favorite bull Tom Lee has to say in this one. All right, let's get into this. I mean, uh, this has been a victory for those who've been bearish. Um, but to me, this is also a reminder that the stock market... And investor views about equities really depends on Fang. You know, Fang didn't do well this week in earnings, and it really sort of took some of the support out of stocks. Wait, wait, wait. What? What are we talking about? What are we talking about, Tom Lee? Excuse me, Mr. Tom Lee. Sir. Sir. No. What? Tom Lee. Have you ever read an earnings report before? Is this? Have you never done that before? Like, just do you not understand how an income statement works, Tom Lee? Like, what are you talking about? Those earnings were freaking amazing. I don't care who you look at. Microsoft was a great A. Meta was an A+. Google was a great A. Those, those earnings reports were phenomenal. Amazon was an A+. You can't say anything bad about those earnings reports from the big dogs. But come on, Tom Lee. That was just a ridiculous statement. Their stock prices didn't do well. But when you talk about their earnings were bad, no. No. I mean, that's, that's just a ridiculous, ridiculous statement. But to me, this is also a reminder that the stock market and investor views about equities really depends on Fang. You know, Fang didn't do well this week in earnings. They did do well. Really sort of they did amazing. Of out of stocks. Do I think the Fang thesis is changed or broken? I mean, I don't think so. To me, if someone hasn't owned Fang all year, this is a chance to get in. But the thesis can be intact, right? That these are the places you want to be. You can have that while still saying, you know what, the stock's got too stretched and the valuations got too rich, and now it's time for a pullback. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, we're down 10% from the highs for the S&P, so I think a lot of bad news is baked in, but we've also done, as you point out, a lot of technical damage, and people don't like the tenure at 5%. I mean, this is why next week is pretty critical, because we do get some pretty important data points. I mean, momentum's a dangerous thing at times, right? I mean, you can, you can say, well, it, it can carry you in, when the times are good for, for these FANG names. And that was one of the criticisms the whole time. It's seven stocks and 493 stink. And then now it's <laughs> 493 still stink and the seven look dicey. That's a problem. That's it funny. is. Um, I think there is some good news. You know, I think this week there has been some improvement in the internals of the other 493. We did a, a report even last night about how the small caps are starting to look a little stronger. So I think the, the 493 is less bad. And in terms of re returning capital and compounding capital, the FANG story is strong. So you're right. I don't know if the market's comfortable with the multiple now, but in 12 months, I think they're great opportunities. Is this a cautionary tale about where earnings expectations have gone? That's been the big debate. Now we're out of the earnings recession. We start to get lift off, and then we get higher and higher as you turn the calendar into next year. Do we need to rethink where we are because we're worried about the economy? Rates are high and may remain such. Yeah, I've got a contrarian take on earnings. Um, number one, if you look at the stock market reaction of those that beat, they're up half a percent. That's better than Q1 and Q2 of this year. So actually, we're getting better reactions. It's just like you said, it's more in the 493, not the fangs. Um, the PMIs have turned up year over year, and historically that leads to earnings growth year over year, so it's confirming that earnings should strengthen from here. And if we look at even Q3 earnings, you know, they've actually gone up 2% since the start of reporting season. So I think the FANG's disappointed in terms of market reaction, but the rest of the market's actually been okay, and I think that is what's going to help us get through the rest of this year. I just wonder if there's a counterintuitive way to look at that. So PMI is good, good for earnings. However, the Fed doesn't necessarily want all this to be good. 
right? They want demand in, in some respects to start to slow down, and they've been unsuccessful in, in getting it to do that. So as they potentially step up, step up their efforts to make demand slow down, that potentially hits earnings, doesn't it? Uh, you're right. I think there is a view that the Fed is running out of patience. They're like, look, when are we going to break the economy? Um, but I think this, the, the, maybe the more subtle point is I think the Fed like, would like to see the labor market slow down because we know underlying the, the two big drivers of inflation are housing and autos. They've slowed, but the job market's still strong. Next week is the jobs report. If it's soft, I think that takes the edge off. And, and of course, next week we get the FOMC meeting. And again, I, I think that they're going to be patient because a lot of tightening, especially five year, 5% tenure, is already going through this pipeline. So I think the Fed can actually be patient. Sure, but uh, no. Now, I agree with you that the backup in rates has given them the, pace, the flexibility to be, to be patient. It suggests that, well, the, the move in rates has done some of the work for us. However, if the labor market starts to show softening, then we have to worry about what's been the whole key to this thing to begin with, and that's the consumer remaining strong. Job losses pick up, spending goes down, the soft landing story starts to unravel, doesn't it? It's a delicate balance because, you know, you really want to see jobs at 100000 a month. And you want to see wage expectations cool off. So it's a tricky calculus, but I, I think that we don't have to reflexively say, hey, if the job market slows down, we're headed for a hard landing. That might be the market's reaction, but then that ends up being an overreaction. You're, you're still a Bitcoin bull? Yes. I want to end our, our conversation on that because it's, I think it's the best performing asset class of the year. Yeah. Certainly one of them. It's up more than 100%. So what's your view of it here? And why has it been going up the way it has been recently? Uh, well, it's a good question. You know, uh, there's a couple things. One is uh, it's been real buying. So there's real money institutional buying. We can see it in the CME volumes at all-time highs. Mm -hmm. And we know Asia has been buying again, and they've been absent. So this is true people wanting to get in. It's been a good sound money story, especially as we worry about Washington. ETF optimism, too? Is yes. that where you're going to go also? Yeah, the ETF, I think, is far bigger than people realize uh, because, again, supply is going to be only $12 million a day after the, the halvening. ETF could be $100 million a day of demand. Yeah, you know, I've always had a view that Bitcoin has one big last layer low, leg lower. Like one big last suck in of everybody and then the the heavy drop to like 10,000 or something like that. I don't know. Just always been something I, I kind of like, oh, I could see that happening. Like one last big suck in of everybody and everybody thinks, oh, Bitcoin's going to the moon and then just get pummeled, right? And then you get every last soul who's only believes in Bitcoin because of it going up in value. You get every single one of those out and you get only the, the true believers of Bitcoin left at that point in time if you could get one last big, huge flush. Much love and have a great day.